Welcome to Unit 5 of AP Biology. Um, this overall unit is heredity, and today's focus is going to be on meiosis and genetic diversity. So let's get started with a review. So here you see an overview of meiosis, and what I want you to take a look at is those sort of blue ovals. And what I want you to fill in is how many chromosomes and how many chromatids um, would you expect to find in humans at each of these stages of meiosis? And then also down at the bottom, there are two questions. What separates during meiosis one and what separates during meiosis two? So in humans, um, in most of our daily lives, most of our cells have 46 chromosomes and 46 chromatids, so one chromatid per chromosome. Um, after DNA replication, which occurs before meiosis, um, we get a DNA replication, which means we have twice the number of chromatids. So over on the left, you see we have 46 chromosomes and 92 chromatids following interface. After meiosis 1, we have 23 chromosomes and 46 chromatids, and that's because in meiosis 1, there's a separation of homologous chromosomes. And then at the end, what we end up with is gametes, and a gamete has in humans 23 chromosomes, 23 chromatids, and that's because in the process of meiosis 2, um, sister chromatids were separated. So I'd like to point out that this diagram does not show 46 chromosomes. Um, it, it looks here like there are only uh, four total chromosomes, so that in the gametes we end up with two chromosomes. Um, you'll very rarely see a diagram showing all of the human chromosomes in meiosis or mitosis, because honestly it's just too much to draw. It starts looking messy. So now let's review those two steps of meiosis um, in a little bit more detail. So here we have sort of a different model where we're seeing um, the changes in the chromosomes. So once again, we're not seeing all 46. Imagine this is some organism with fewer chromosomes. How many chromosomes are here, and is this showing before or after DNA replication? So this organism has eight chromosomes, and this is showing after DNA replication, because each of those chromosomes is shown in that X form as having two chromatids. All right, so another uh, review of what meiosis I and meiosis II are, what happens in each of these steps. So in meiosis I, we get a separation of the homologous chromosomes. So now in um, the two cells, instead of just one cell, after that first division of meiosis one, we have four chromosomes in each of these cells, um, but they are still in their duplicated form. They still have two chromatids each. Then in meiosis two, we get the separation of sister chromatids. So in this case, we have four chromosomes with one chromatid each. So four chromosomes, four chromatids. And if you remember, at the beginning, this organism started with eight chromosomes. So now in these gametes, we have half the genetic information. Um, another way of saying that is our original organism is diploid, and these gametes are haploid. So they have half the genetic information. So let's do a very brief overview of the history of genetics. Um, you may be familiar with this guy. This is uh, Gregor Mendel, um, and he was a monk who um, had a garden, and he grew a lot of peas. He grew a lot of other things, too, but he did a lot of uh, work on pea plants. So he established the principles of inheritance and coined the terms dominant and recessive. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, he was also the first to really use some, some quality statistical methods to analyze and predict hereditary information. We're going to be doing some statistical analysis analyses um, related to genetics later in this unit. So before we move on, let's make sure we get a definition for the terms dominant and recessive because they come up a lot in genetics. So if an organism is heterozygous for a trait, that means they have two different alleles, uh, there's a question of which trait will be expressed. The trait that is expressed in that heterozygote individual is dominant, and the trait that is hidden is the recessive trait. Um, a definition, we term traits that are Mendelian, Mendelian traits, are those controlled by a single gene and that have a dominant and recessive form or allele. So these traits are very simple and therefore they're useful in understanding the basics of heredity, but please be aware that most traits are much more complicated than this. You can see on the bottom left some of the pea plant traits that he studied, um, and these are ones that are very common in sort of introgenetic problems. Um, so we for for example, are going to be um, looking at seed color and seed shape, so round versus wrinkled, yellow versus green, and we're also going to be looking at flower color of purple versus white. We'll do some um, looking at other organisms uh, to do some practice uh, Punnett squares, some practice, practice genetic problems, um, but the pea plants come up over and over. 
All right, so let's go into um, a couple of the things that Mendel uh, figured out. So the first one is Mendel's law of segregation. And the law of segregation states that two alleles in a pair segregate or separate from each other into different gametes during gamete formation. So if here we see a very simple organism, or maybe we're just drawing part of an organism's genome, but either way, the parent genotype is big A, little a. So that means there are two separate forms of that same gene. Um, there's a dominant form represented by the capital and a recessive form represented by the lowercase. So in this case, we just have a total of two chromosomes, one homologous pair. What will this look like after DNA replication and then after meiosis? Try to draw this out. So after DNA replication, we have um, now two chromatids for each chromosome. So we have a um, complete copying of those chromosomes. And then after meiosis, after both steps of division, we end up with four cells. These are the gamete cells. So I want you to notice that half of the gametes end up with a big A and half of the gametes end up with a little a. And this is what Mendel's law of segregation is all about, is that those two alleles, the big A, little, ba, little a, end up in separate gametes during gamete formation. So that's Mendel's law of segregation. Mendel has another law, which is independent assortment. This one's a little bit more complicated, so we'll spend a little bit more time on it. So the big idea here is that pairs of homologous chromosomes are separated to form haploid cells, and this assortment of homologous chromosomes is random. So take a look at the left. Now we have um, two different traits, and these traits are coded for by genes that are on two different chromosomes. Um, so we have big R, little r, and big Y, little y. Uh, this is what it looks like before replication and after replication. I want you to show me what it might look like after the first division of meiosis. And there are actually two possibilities. See if you can draw both possibilities, or at least try to draw one. So if you remember that meiosis separates out those um, homologous chromosomes. So after meiosis one, we will end up with two cells, each with two uh, homologous chromosomes in it. There are two possibilities. We could have those dominant genes um, in the same cell, or we could have them split up. So at the top, you see we have big R, big R, big Y, big Y, and on the, um, on the right, little r, little r, little y, little y. And then on the bottom, there's the opposite possibility, is where um, the homologous chromosomes um, sort of split up in different ways. These are equally likely. So this is what me, it means by independent, um, is that these two chromosomes, uh, chromosome one that's pictured as longer and chromosome two that's pictured as shorter, where they end up, which cells they end up in, is random respect to one another. So where chromosome one goes is independent of where chromosome two goes. All right, so let's continue this example and see if we can figure out what this means in terms of the gametes that can be produced. So what are the possible gametes produced by um, that po first possibility? And what are the possible gametes produced by the second possibility? See if you can draw those out. So in the first case, possibility one, the resulting gametes will be either big R is with big Y, or we have little r with little y. In possibility two, we have big R with little y or, and little r with big y. Now you remember that in fertilization, um, only one of these gametes is going to be used to produce that next offspring. Um, and another gamete is going to be coming from um, another individual. Uh, there are self-fertilizing individuals, but, but let's keep it simple here and say that um, just one of these gametes is going to be used to produce the offspring. What that means is this organism, if we can go back a little bit and be reminded of what that parent's genotype was, so this parent's genotype was big R, little r, big Y, little y. The possible gametes from this um, organism are, um, there are four different possibilities, either big R, big Y, little r, little y, big r, little y, and little r, big y. And because these two genes are on separate chromosomes, all of these are equally likely. Here's another diagram showing the law of independent assortment. I like this one just because it shows all of it in one spot. 
Um, so if you are looking for a review, I think this is a pretty good diagram to look at. And then the principle of independent assortment is described at the bottom. It's defined slightly differently, but the overall, um, the overall idea is the same. So here it's talking about more specifically applying to this example. The genes for seed shape and seed color assort independently because they are located on different chromosomes. So the seed shape is that big R or little r, and the seed color is the big Y or little y. Um, seed shape, the big R stands for round. Seed color, the big Y stands for yellow. So these two uh, traits are not connected to one another because of the law of independent assortment. All right, there is an added uh, sort of complication to meiosis, but it's something really important and really exciting because it's another way of introducing genetic variation. So during um, the step where the, um, the homologous chromosomes are aligning, so during prophase, of, prophase one of meiosis, where you um, start having things beginning to be lined up, like they're fully lined up in metaphase, you get what's called crossing over. So chromosomes um, that are next to each other, homologous chromosomes, they connect some of their, their genetic information, they physically bend over um, some of the uh, genetic information, and it's exchanged. So what was on one chromatid switches over and goes on to a different chromatid. So it's still the same genes, it's just maybe going to be different forms of those genes. So you notice the chromosomes don't change length here, they don't change the amount of genetic information they have, they just change what kind of information is there. So crossing over is the exchange of genetic material between non-sister chromatids during prophase one of meiosis. So it happens just before metaphase. Crossing over results in recombinant chromatids. So you can notice on the right there, it's showing there are recombinant chromatids and non-recombinant chromatids. Recombinant chromatids look different than the original chromatids. Non-recombinant chromatids look the same as those original chromatids. All right, so this brings us to a discussion of genetic diversity. These two um, sort of aspects that we just talked about both lead to genetic diversity. So this begs the question, what is the advantage of having genetically diverse offspring? Populations and even sort of litters of kittens with high genetic diversity are better able to adapt more resistant to disease. Um, so if you have a population that is all identical, you can have um, one environment that is very in unsuitable for all of those individuals, or you can have a, a disease that runs rampant through the population. If individuals are different from one another, it's more likely that some of those individuals are going to survive in whatever environment it is. And then it's also uh, more likely that a disease won't pass through and kill off all of the individuals, that some individuals will be better able to survive that. So we just talked about two major aspects that lead to genetic diversity. So meiosis leads to genetic diversity through what two processes? So the two processes of meiosis that lead to genetic diversity are independent assortment and recombination. So to follow this up with an example, let's imagine that we're paying attention to two traits in these kittens, and let's imagine that they're both Mendelian traits. Let's say one is the um, volume of their meow, and the other is the um, length of their claws. And let's say those are both coded for by a single gene. They're not really, but let's imagine. So in this litter of kittens, you could end up with all of them having unique genotypes. So some of them have loud meows, some of them have um, loud meows with, um, with short claws, some of them have loud meows with long claws, so they can have any kind of combination. So even having a single parent cat um, can produce a wide variety of different genotypes in the offspring, which means that um, maybe one of them will be able to do better in an environment than another. So we're going to leave it off here for today, and next time we will return and talk more about Mendelian traits.